Okay, so I'm also going to talk about the uptake of nanoparticles, so you will see more of endocytic pathways. <coughs> because many particles with drugs need to be taken into cells by endocytic mechanisms in order to work in an optimal manner. And you have already seen some of these pathways that can be used by nanoparticles to get into the cells. <laughs> and not only do they use several mechanisms, but... Hmm. Not only do they use several mechanisms, but they can also induce their own uptake if they become associated with the membrane. And often they end up in endosomes, but they can also go to different locations in the cell. And of course, if you look at the different mechanisms in a non-polarized cell, which is something we often do, it can be quite different from a real polarized cell. It can be an epithelial or endothelial cell, where it turns out that clathrin-independent mechanisms on the apical and the basolateral side, they are differentially regulated. And for instance, cavioli can be found on only one side in some cases. So that's very different from just looking at the non-polarized version. And um, one should, of course, be aware of that there are several interactions between endocytic pathways. So if you try to affect only one, you may certainly affect several others at the same time. For instance, there is a co-regulation of Calveolar and CDC42-dependent fluid phase uptake. If one tries to study the role of Calveoli by upregulating uh, phosphocalveolin, one will, of course, affect Calveolar uptake, but one will, at the same time, down-regulate fluid phase uptake through the CDC42 dependent pathway. And on the other hand, if you knock down caveolin, you will stimulate fluid phase uptake through this pathway. And it turns out that also caveine can down-regulate the CDC42 dependent pathway. So um, particles, as I mentioned, can induce their own uptake and they can also induce intracellular changes due to multivalent binding and cross-linking of proteins or lipids on the cell surface. For instance, we found some years ago that uptake of the toxin ricin B uh, by coupling it to a quantum dot, it occurs by a macropinocytosis-like mechanism. And that's, I think, something one often sees when one looks at uptake of particle. And this is in contrast to the uptake mechanism for the single ligand put on the uh, particle. Also, this is an example not from my lab, that cross-linking of glycolipids can induce changes in membrane curvature. Here is a Shiga toxin-induced tubule formation. It's a pentavalent toxin. It was published by Römer and co-workers in Nature. And these <coughs> invaginations are formed by the cross-linking of the toxin at the cell surface. And more recently, it was published that these uh, invaginations, they are also depend on the protein endophilin A. So when you cross-link, for instance, glycolipids at the cell surface, many things may happen. Uh, this is uh, cross-linking of GB3, either by Shiga toxin, which you see here, or by adding antibodies to GB3. Then it turns out that there is a calcium flux through the membrane, there is activation and phosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase SYC, and then there is dissociation of a complex consisting of annexin A1 and phospholipase A2. And with, when phospholipase A2 becomes free, of course, it acts on the membrane. It can cause tubulation and changes in intracellular transport. So this shows relocalization of annexin A1 in cells where you cross-link GB3 at the cell surface by adding Shiga B. Here's a control cell where you see annexin A1 in green, the lysosomal marker in red. And you can clearly see changes caused by cross-linking and signaling from the cell surface. So again, to optimize delivery, the common question is, which endocytic mechanism is involved in uptake of a given particle? A 
common question asked is, is cholesterol involved? And then, of course, what does this tell us? Then one has to remember that several mechanisms are cholesterol dependent. For instance, if you add cyclodextrin <coughs> to extract cholesterol or genistein to check whether you affect uptake, one should remember these are not cavioli specific inhibitors. And in order to help out, we some years ago published a toolbox of pharmacological inhibitors to study endocytosis, and you see these two here, cyclodextrin, which extracts <coughs> cholesterol, and philippin, which binds to cholesterol, and then you can read what they are doing, and I will show you a couple of examples, that cholesterol is also important for clathrin-dependent endocytosis. When you look at a clathrin code, you can have quite flat ones, more invaginated or almost pinched off, you can divide them into group one, two, and three. Here you see them in control cells, and when you add cyclodextrin to extract cholesterol, you get much more of flat-coated pits, so you really affect that pathway. You also affect macropinocytosis. Cholesterol is essential for macropinocytosis. This is a control cell here which has taken up a little HRP, which gives the black staining. If you stimulate macropinocytosis by adding the forbol ester TPA, you see big vesicles as expected. But if you then extract a little uh, of the cholesterol before you add the forbol ester, you see the cell is still quiet. It can't macropinocytose anymore. So one has to be careful. And also, particles may end up in a different location than the ligand you add to the particle. For instance, transferring Q dots are endocytosed via clathrin-coated pits, but they do not recycle. We don't know whether this is size-dependent. Shiga B Q dots, they do not go to the Golgi as Shiga B does, so they end up in a different location. And we have found that particles may affect other pathways in the cell than those they use themselves. Whether that's due to trapping of membrane is still not known. This is just to show you that Shiga B uh, normally goes to the Golgi and becomes co-localized with the Golgi marker TGN46, but if you put it on a Q dot, it never goes to the Golgi. So how can one make sure that a given ligand or nanoparticle is internalized by the cell and not only absorbed to the cell membrane? One really should differentiate between membrane absorbed substance and what's really inside. There are several possibilities. One can do EM with serial sectioning, EM with fixation in the presence of ruthenium red, or for instance, confocal microscopy with set stacks. I won't go through all this, but I will show you that it can be useful to add ruthenium red during fixation. It gives a black staining of everything which is connected to the cell surface. And for instance, if you look at this structure, you might have thought it was inside the cell because it's cut like that, but you can see it's stained with this dye. So it's surface connected. And one can use set stacks. And here you see another example with staining with ruthenium red where you have a true endosome with gold particles and you see the membrane here is not stained like the ones I just showed you. And of course one can also uh, get a good idea from the super resolution microscopes. There's one example here, I won't go into it, but you have the red nanoparticles, you have green lysosomes and the cell nucleus. And here you can see a single lysosome containing red particles. And you see the resolution one pixel here is 40 nanometers. So then it starts to help. So we think that cell biological background is important to draw the right conclusions. One can see a lot of strange conclusions published in high-impact journals. And in order to try to get to the right conclusions, it's really essential with interdisciplinary collaborations these days. And uh, some collaborators in Oslo, uh, this is my group, more or less. I'm also uh, heading a national competence building project. We call it NANOCAN. It consists of uh, 10 Norwegian groups with international partners. And uh, 
these are some other uh, international collaborators. These are toxin collaborators. I'm still working on uptake of toxins. And last year at uh, Clinham, we had dinner one evening with Peter Church, uh, who is here, and this has also led to a new collaboration on nanoparticles. And I think my last slide is here. This is a recent picture of the Oslo group. So thank you for your attention. Is there a you said that when you when you have a you know, when you have a targeting moiety, and then the tar the targeting the, like rising or whatever, and you put that to another particle, then it may it may go to another part and with what you have uh, or it may take another entry route. Mm -hmm. um, is there a size limit where it does not use anymore? Is there a size uh, cutoff where does this depend on the size of the particle? I don't know. I think it's due to the cross-linking. It has been shown in some other instances that when you cross-link um, various molecules, you may get a, a recruitment of RAC, and then you start the macrobinocytic uh, process. Thank you very much. There are no other questions. Then the next talk is uh, from uh, Mr. Hoffman.